interested. Um, just to let you know, we have a student social event tonight. It's a trivia night. Um, you can find more details on the schedule. Um, one thing they want you to do, if you can, please try to register. If you forget to register, that's okay. You can still show up tonight and they'll assign you to a team. So just uh, encourage you to register if you can so that we'll have an idea of the numbers, but uh, if not, just show up. Uh, also the winners, uh, Human Kinetics have donated a few uh, textbooks as well. So the winners will get some biomechanics textbooks to add to your library. Maybe one day your library will be as big as Scott's back there. Um, so I'm gonna do a brief introduction. Uh, first off, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Thea Markless and C-Motion for being the primary sponsor of the conference. Uh, they, they sponsored us uh, in Halifax as well, so it, it's good to keep that uh, relationship going. And our talker today is uh, Dr. Scott Selby. He's the president of Thea Markless and he's the director of research at C-Motion. He's also an adjunct professor at Queen's University and the University of Massachusetts. Uh, during his career, he has made a substantial contribution to the field of biomechanical analysis, uh, especially in developing some of the tools for this analysis. And that's going to be kind of the focus of the talk today. So uh, thank you, Scott, again, and I'll, I'll let you take over. Oh, thank you. I hope everyone can hear me because I can't tell from this end. Um, I'm Scott Selby. I'm very pleased to be here. I'd like to thank the organizers. Um, partly for letting me speak, partly for letting us sponsor this event. Uh, I want to take, I want to thank the, or congratulate really, um, Steve and Jessica for winning the awards yesterday. Um, I did see, I did see their talks and quite enjoyed them. Um, my talk here, the title needs to be unpacked just a little bit. The video-based markerless tracking and dynamic stereo x-ray don't need a lot of introduction anymore. They're fairly well established. Still new somewhat, but they're established. But I have to unpack what I mean by two ends of the spectrum. What spectrum am I talking about here? Um, this is a biomechanics conference, and I'm going to just show my bias right up front. Now, this is a quote from a, a colleague um, that says, we have a brain for one reason and one reason only, and that's to produce adaptable and complex movements. So. If anyone in the room like me believes that, we do believe that measuring and understanding movement is relevant for understanding the brain and for how we do things. So what am I talking about? What is my spectrum? My spectrum is really the skeleton, the segments that make up the skeleton, sometimes the muscles that move that skeleton, but, but really, that skeleton, that's what, we're, that's what I'm talking about. So how do we represent that? Pose estimation has some strange uses in the, in the community. Um, for me, it means just the position and orientation of every segment of the body. So what I'm talking about here is how do we get to a representation of the body that is the position and orientation of all the segments? The accuracy that we can look at this data or gross movements, I'm talking actual movements, dynamic movements where you're stepping, jumping, reaching, not lying inside a, a bore of something, just movement. We can look at it as the joint level, and that's one end of my spectrum. This is biplane video radiography, or at least the results of it. This is the pose of the femur and the tibia during a gait cycle. The resolution here is a little bit different from most of the recordings of dynamic movement. And I want to talk about that. I want to talk about that extreme. The other extreme is in some sense is way more fun. Just uncontrolled movement, no sensors, no markers, no measurements, subject moves in the volume, we record them. And that's the other end of the spectrum from me. These can be recorded live game or in a laboratory. So that's what my talk's about. I'm gonna look through two lenses at pose estimation of multi-body models of humans. 
lot of cats or dogs, not deformable models. I'm talking about multi-segment rigid models of the body. This is two companies I actually represent two, as Sean pointed out. C-Motion's been around for almost 25 years. This is usually a visual 3D presentation about C-Motion. But I thought I'd take the opportunity here to talk a little bit about X-Ray. And if I get into a little bit of deep water here and, and wave my hands around, which you can't even see, um, it's because I wish Pete Lone was here presenting this for me because he's the developer of this. The other end of the spectrum is Thea Markerless. It's much newer. It's not really two years old. Although I did present Thea Markerless at the last CSB in Halifax. That was our, we weren't even a company then, but we had prototype software and I was given the chance to talk about it at that meeting. And I wanted to come back and talk about it again. So let's dive in to DSX. It's a long, complicated term, arthrokinematics. It really just means we're, we're talking about the kinematics within the joint of joint surfaces. DSX is what we call our software, and there are there are other softwares out there. Um, in the end, it's really biplane video radiography. But what I want to do here, this is movement of the knee during walking. I just want to show you the accuracy we can get markerless tracking of the knee during movement. So bias and precision or accuracy, reliability, choose your numbers. We're down around a millimeter or less and less than a degree. It's only at this level could you even possibly talk about ligament movement. And the ligaments in the knee during walking or running might only lengthen seven millimeters. You can't very well have a technology that's accurate to, well, seven millimeters. You have to be considerably lower than that. So if you want to talk about what's going on in a joint, this is the way we can do it right now. This is a picture of the lab at Queen's University. Um, Mike Rainbow and his students probably have many presentations this week about that. As you can see, it's a little bit complicated. There's lots of stuff in here. Getting that accuracy of bone movement is not just handed to you. There's some work that has to be done here. This is just a different view in the laboratory. This is, this is a pretty empty slide. I think Mike's got stuff all over the back of the room now. What you're seeing is two image intensifiers with the shadows of the leg. And you're seeing highlighted on the subject, kind of the volume we can expect to be able to calculate. So it's not a particularly big volume, but you'll notice the subject is free to jump or land or run, but we don't have a lot of time to collect data and we don't have a big volume. So at this level, we're really looking at one joint, or if you choose to use the foot and can see the whole foot, the whole foot. But this is what we're talking about. So this is an experiment. So this is the lab at University of Pittsburgh, a very similar setup to the lab at Queens. And you just see a subject running in front. Again, you'll see the image intensifiers and the X-ray units and the recording and, and, and the results. This is this is an old slide, but it's the results from from that study. Um, they're getting better now, but as you can see, by the time the occlusions come in the left side, we've got a very brief moment of during loading of the joint for which we can start talking about the loading. And and how do we talk about loading without a mathematical model? Then you can't directly or without instrumenting the, the tibia, you can't actually measure that force. So there are surrogate measures that are used. And the surrogate measure that is most common is just a distance map. How close are the bones, are, are really cartilages, but how, how close are they to each other? And you can see this is pretty steady movement. This is not filtered. This is what you get out of this system when it works. Um, 
And granted, the, the knee is fairly easy, but you have to start somewhere. And if you look at it in various ways, you, the software just allows you to look at these distance maps from different angles. This is looking directly down on the, on the tibia, the tibial plateau, and the colors just represent distances during walking. You can see the foot moving underneath because we're actually freezing the, the tibia in this case. Okay, and this is the kind of reports people do. They're looking at the contact point in black. This is Scott, a slide of Scott Tashman's and estimating the contact point and how it changes during the gait cycle. You can, you can see the path there, the, the, the pressure moves and the pressures are different in a knee with osteoarthritis on the right and the control subject. And of course, these, these differences are what we're trying to explore and in, in trying to get the etiology of, of osteoarthritis. And I say we, and that's very loosely. Um, my job is to provide the tools so that other people like, can do this. So what, what is this process? How, how do we go about doing it? And, and where's, where's the work being done or, or the, the research that's being done here and what we're trying to do? Well, the first thing we do is we need a bone. And I think there are many talks at this meeting about extracting bones from CT scans. You'll see a red and blue arrow. There's a green one in there too, but I've got the bone colored green. Um, that's a reference frame. So that's our local coordinate system assigned to this bone. So this historically came from a CT scan. And for all of those who wanna know it's x-rays, there's a lot of exposure. Most of the exposure is actually the CT scan. These X-ray systems, these dynamic systems are, are gated or pulsed. And the X-ray is only on for a very short period of time. So the actual X-ray exposure during a set of, of 10 trials is, is kind of like a long distance flight. It's, it's not owners. It's this part here is the CT scan is our problem. One of the problems with CT is it's hard to get cartilage. So what what we've had to we've had to do, people have had to do, oh Pete's done a lot of it, is you obviously have to take MR, MRI data, and go and highlight the cartilage in the MRI. And the bone you can see in the MRI is black. But you you extract that as best you can and register to the CT scan. So now you have the CT scan of the bone and the MRI scan of the cartilage segmented. So now our distance maps have a little more meaning than the figure I showed. I showed it in the figure of just bones because it was easier to see. But we really want to know the distance between cartilages, not the distance between bones. So once you've got them registered, to get the distance maps, you have to have some way to map this surface. It's not terribly complicated. It's just that there's really isn't any commercial software out there for doing it. And there's not a lot of other software. You have to find represent some surface that has that's meaningful in the sense that it should be kind of an evenly distributed set of polygons. So in our case, you just get an approximate surface and you drop it on and then you project it. So you now have surfaces, just parts of the bone. And these are the only parts we're really looking at for what we're doing. So you have to extract the bone. We have to extract cartilage. We have to merge that. People are getting better at getting bones from MRI. I'm not going to argue, but that's not the way we've done it so far. And you have to give them coordinate systems that make some sense, anatomical sense, and consistency across. And you have to give them surfaces that are interacting. So here's the software. You see the bone there on the left. What we've got here is a digital or virtual representation of the X-ray. Through just standard calibration, optical calibration, you can compute where the X-ray emitters are and where the sensors are. And now you want to align your virtual X-ray 
with real x-ray. Mathematically, it means taking the bones there in the middle and just keep wiggling them uh, until the virtual x-ray that's colored on the screen there and the real one overlap. It, this can be a pretty tricky process for anyone who's done it and trickier, the more tricky the bones you're trying to track. So the lumbar spine is particularly tricky. But, but here's what it would look like on a frame by frame basis. I, I've, I've taken the opportunity to just show two different ways of processing the images, trying to enhance the edges or trying to enhance internal features. Um, you can do it. The, the algorithms don't actually see it this way, but this is effectively what we're doing. You do this on a frame by frame basis. And you solve for the pose. And you get this. That's where we started in the first slide. That's where we get to now. Now, said problem, a challenge, is that the CT scan is this huge exposure. So there are a bunch of heads in the room nodding right now going, oh, yeah, I know where he's going. We're going to define a statistical shape model. And there are so many talks on this, I'm not going to give you the details. Essentially, we're going to create a parameterized model of the bone that we can morph to fit any subject. What you're seeing here is just one of the principal components. I'm just scaling it. So you'll see that, it, that some of the principal components just scale. This is a different one. It, it affects a different structure. So, but this isn't quite what we want. Not quite. This statistical shape model really refers to the surface of the bone. But if we're trying to build an X-ray, we actually have to have some internal features. We have to be able to see the the surface, the cortex of, of the bone as a thickness. So you can do the equivalent of a statistical shape model, and I thank Alison Kluche, she's out there. Um, and you actually do a statistical shape and intensity model, and it, and it allows you to actually get some internal structures. So Alison generated this for us quite a while ago. So on the left, you'll see the actual CT scan. On the right, you'll see the, the shape model that we're using. Um, we've got sidetracked with other stuff, but our intention is if you can replace a statistical shape and intensity model for the CT scan of the bone, and if you can scale it from the X-ray data, the biplanar data, then maybe we don't have to do the CT scan. And that makes this considerably more accessible. So one of the challenges of the x-ray part, everybody in this room probably realizes from the equipment you saw and the number of people that you've seen presenting it, meaning not that many, there aren't many in the world. And as a software company, it's a pretty small market. Um, so we're, we're plodding along just Trying, trying to help and, and go where we can. Sooner or later, surgeons are going to want to look inside the knee or the ankle. And then we might have a product. On the other hand, let's look at this other lens. The other lens, in some sense, is more exciting because it's now. We're not waiting for it. This is, this is now. The x-ray, you know, we're going to have to wait for that to have, to, to fully be immersed in, in the community in orthopedics. Markerless tracking is here now. So what do we think we're doing at the 3D? Well, we're not alone. There are, there are competitors, but since I don't represent them, I'm gonna talk about us. We're trying to change tracking, how people track human motion. We think we provide accessible, high fidelity, robust solutions for quantifying movement or performance. And one of the underlying um, goals is that everyone, athlete, patient, whatever, should be measured in context 
in the context by which they perform. If you take a high performance athlete and put them in the laboratory, you're not going to record their best performance. Partly because they're in a laboratory, but athletes require motivation. And it's really hard to be motivated to be in a laboratory. So we want to measure in context. There's still tools that have to be developed. We want to get there. So this blurry setup, this is Marcus Brown, one of the co-founders of the company and, and really the, the mind behind the deep neural network here. Um, just running through the data collection process, you couldn't see it. Well, you never, what you sh should have seen was at no point did he stop to put markers on or stop to put sensors on. At no point did he do um, a standing trial. At no point did he actually calibrate the cameras. Because surprisingly, for video based recording, it, we're months between having to calibrate the volume. The extrinsic camera parameters just hold forever. And what you see in the end here is a skeleton, a three dimensional representation of the skeleton, not something we squeezed into a 2D image. If you can get a decent camera view, you can track on the field. So you can monitor players on the field. You can put them on the field just in practice. And I'm going to come back to baseball later because this is a particularly interesting application for markerless. A, it works. B, it's possible it's changing the game. And then how many, I've been in biomechanics a long time. And there aren't that many instances where we can change the game. This seems to be one. So what do we do? We use a synchronized array of cameras. So far, in our testing and in our hands, we need multiple cameras if your goal is accuracy in three dimensions. If you want accuracy, we believe you still need multiple cameras. So in our case, typically eight cameras, then they're synchronized. And I think really special about the cameras other than they're synchronized and they're aimed at the subject. The next step in the process is we actually try to recognize people. We need to, because there could be many people in a field of view, this, this could be sports. It could be in a clinic and someone's got to walk very closely to the subject so they don't fall over. So we need to recognize each person so that we have the same person in every camera and so that we can track people as they come in and out of the volume. And this is a combination of facial recognition, which is pretty standard these days, and feature recognition, which has become standard. In the last 10 years ago or so, it was finally made popular that a deep neural network could recognize handwriting. And then just leaps and bounds, it can recognize many things. If it can recognize squiggles and circles, if it can recognize letters and numbers, well, it could recognize parts of the body too. And that's what we're doing. We're using a deep neural network to go in and recognize parts of the body and put what's really a virtual marker on the body. These ne neural networks at this point are still require a substantial background of training data. Training data means someone has to go in and annotate or digitize images of people. For those in the audience as, as old as me, you remember digitizing film and thinking we'd got away from it while well, we're going back to it. We've been annotating. Um, just to give credit where credit is due, when I presented at the last CSB meeting, these were the five annotators that we had at that time. 
They're the ones that produce the core basic images for this. This year we have a few more. And obviously it's Skype, we can't get together. But we have a few more annotators right now as we continue to annotate. Once you have those, I'm going to show it in a sec. Once you have that, then you fit a skeleton to it. We fit our multi-body model to this cloud of points. And then the last bit, and the bit that's close to my heart because it's what takes up my thought, is how do we validate and what does that even mean? I'll talk a little bit about that, but I think Rob Kanko may be in the audience, but he's certainly at this meeting with at least three posters and one presentation talking about the work he's done on this. So let's look at the first step. Just in the lab, that's that's Rob himself and, and that's my son. One of the weird things about video is you can pretty much tell who people are, so you have to be careful about getting permission to show people. Um, this, you can play in the lab. It's a lot more fun to collect data in the lab where you can just try stuff because you don't have to put markers or sensors. You don't have to calibrate. You don't have to set up. You just do stuff. So what you see here is the algorithm is put a square around the subject. We said there's one subject, there's another, and all cameras are following them. That's a complicated step if you have a basketball court full of people. Not so complicated in the laboratory. Now here, if you guys can see, and I've got no idea just how good an image you guys can see, what you'll see is that it looks like there are a whole bunch of blue dots on Marcus here. Those blue dots are the features that the neural network is, rec is, is recognizing. So on every frame of data, on every image in that frame, the neural network predicts features. Some features are obvious. The benchmark data set in the world is mostly joints, hip joint, knee joint, ankle joint. But if all you had were the joint centers, you can't compute 3D pose. And everybody in the room, they're biomechanics, they know this. In order to get a segment pose in three dimensions for an independent segment, you need three points and they can't be collinear. Now the joint centers, don't add up to three. So you have to find other features that can be reliably annotated. And given this cloud of features in all cameras, you fit a skeleton to those features. Now, what we're showing here is not the, the 2D image of what we're seeing from those features, we, we're not trying to use the 2D features, we're creating 3D features. And this is the 3D pose that comprises all of the views of the subject. And then it's projected onto the different video images. So let me make sure I can play this. So that's our process. I think it'll come back. So how well do we do? Can this be done? We've had the wonderful luxury of being able to work with Kevin Deluzio's lab at Queen's University. For the data I'm presenting here, and I'm going to do it very briefly. On the right side is, is Rob Kenko. He's presenting it many times at this meeting. If you want to go and ferret through the numbers, go for it. Uh, Elise Lande in the middle is the postdoc in the lab that's overseeing this and just kind of making sure it all works. But I thank them. They're not really at arm's length because, well, I know them. But at the same time, it's not us collecting the data. So the three papers I'm presenting here, two are now in the Journal of Biomechanics. They're published. The third one's in review, fingers crossed. First thing we needed to do, any of the comparison studies that are gonna be done are often compared you know, between events, from heel strike to toe off, standard gait stuff, from maximum rotation of the upper arm to ball release. But in this case, we're looking at the, at the gait events. And so Rob collected data that'll show a gain in a bit 
marker and markerless simultaneously on a treadmill and just using straight kinematic based events. We didn't really want to cheat, although as much as I'd like to have cheated. Um, kinematic events and then a second set of data because there are a lot of the reviewers in particular said, whoa, it's on a treadmill. I didn't seem to get past the point that we're looking at kinematics and not trying to not trying to say something about gate other than saying we get the same thing from the systems. But nevertheless, so Rob collected another set of data for the subjects walking over ground using different video cameras and compared the data to a gate right now. I'm not going to take you through this collage of points. Go to Rob's poster. Only one of the measures was was really particularly different, and that was stride width, and that's because I don't think we actually know how gate right measures stride width properly. Um, but nevertheless, everything else is sufficiently suitable that when we do the repeatability or reliability, and when we do the comparison against marker based, we know we can get events that are common between the systems. So the next one's repeatability. This is the one I think matters. I, I, I'm tired of talking about marker versus markerless. They're just like two different marker sets. Repeatability, that's what matters. If the subject comes back on different days and you get the same data, you're probably measuring the same thing. And if something changes, you're measuring a change. So how repeatable is Thea 3D for gate? Here are the subjects Rob chose. No, they volunteered. They came back three times to the laboratory, wearing whatever clothes they wore to the university that day. We did not prescribe their clothing, not the color, not the type of clothing. They kind of looked the same because university students dress the same, but nothing here was prescribed. And if we were to prescribe it, we probably would, wouldn't recommend black shoes with black pants and a black shirt if we're trying to recognize features. Here's the only slide I'm going to present from this. This is the mean and standard deviation of the joint ankles, hip, knee, and ankle, in all three planes over the three sessions. And what should be obvious is that they're measuring the same thing. Now remember, there's no standing trial. There are no measurements. There's no functional trial. The subject comes in in their street clothes and their street shoes, walks back and forth in the lab, and walks out. Takes five minutes to do a data collection. Actually, more because I usually ask the subject to do more. But if all you're going to do is walk back and forth, the whole data collection session takes longer to sign the consent form than to do the data collection. This is going to change the kinds of questions you can ask. Because now maybe you can collect thousands of subjects, not tens. Anyways, in all three planes, you can see more variability in axial rotation. That's not really a surprise to anyone. And you're simply you're measuring the same axial rotation in each session. Remember, one week apart. They actually, because the system is generating the model automatically by a trial, it's not even the same model precisely from session to session. You can make it that way, but Rob just let the system go. He didn't prescribe anything. Okay, marker versus markerless. Why don't I like this? Well, first of all, markers make the markerless worse. Our training set of 500,000 subjects, over a million images, all annotated, has never seen a motion capture marker. So if the motion capture marker happens to be placed in one of the features that we're trying to identify, it confuses the algorithm. 
It doesn't want to put it on the sphere, so it tends to choose beside it. So first of all, it's it's unfair to the markerless to do these comparisons. Secondly, the lighting tends to be set up optimized for the infrared cameras. So it never is the best for the video cameras. So walk on a treadmill, collect the data synchronized, the same volume calibration, extrinsic and intrinsic camera parameters are identical. And I'm just gonna jump to one slide, go to Rob's poster to see the rest. On the left, I'm showing segment angles. That's just the, you know, the segment relative to the lab. So independent of other segments. And what you see on the left is the thigh, shank and foot angles relative to the lab. You can see the substantial overlap in flexion extension. You can see over, substantial overlap, abduction, adduction at the thigh and, and the shank. And the foot's a little different, but consistent. Axial rotation, of course, is worse. When I first looked at this graph, I went, oh, geez. Look how much better the marker based is. I was wrong. Blue is markerless or marker based. Red is markerless. There's less variability from the markerless data than the marker based data in axial rotation. On the right is one of the challenges, another challenge in a comparison. So what you see is at the top left of the second panel is hip flexion, the thigh relative to the pelvis. Red is markerless, blue is marker based, and there's a clear offset or bias between them. It's because the pelvis is defined kind of oddly for marker based systems. Using the ASIS and PSIS, you end up with a tilt of the pelvis. So that, that bias is related to just differences in the coordinate system. So we have a choice. We can force them to have the same reference frame, or we can just live with what the systems generate. And Rob chose, and I certainly support it, just let's live with the systems as they come. So see knee flexion, ankle flexion extension, adduction, axial rotation, again, not surprisingly, since there's more variability in marker based in the segment angles, there's more variability in the joint angles too. And we get asked, well, what about running? What about jumping? What about a squat? It, I mean, I suppose if there are enough graduate students in the world, we could test everything, but what we're doing fundamentally is only identifying features frame by frame in an image. We're not actually looking at movement. So to us, the movement actually doesn't matter. What matters is we have a clear view of the subject and can identify features. So an array of cameras, it's a nuisance, but um, we're gonna have to be considerably better at this to have this level of accuracy with fewer cameras. We're using a deep neural network. Those of you who saw the promise of markerless 20 and 30 years ago and it kept failing to deliver, the approach of trying to subtract backgrounds and build up silhouettes and that approach is dead. It can't get any better. The deep neural network doesn't let you down in the same way. Because it's trained on data, whenever it fails to capture the position of the body, because it sees a weird position, when it fails, you just change the data set. You add to the data set. You add the failure to the data set. Okay. So we're almost done here. I think I'm, that's my time. This is what we're asked. When? When will markerless tracking of human motion 
revolutionized biomechanics. That's a strong word, revolutionized, but if you're going to let me have an hour-long talk, I get to be dramatic here. Don't know when. Biomechanics is, is, tends to be laboratory-based right now still. There are a whole bunch of people who have techniques that they're happy with, that are, that are solving their problems. Until biomechanics starts asking questions differently, asking questions for which markerless is better, better maybe because it's more efficient to collect data, and you can collect lots of it, better because you can collect multiple people at once, or better because subjects aren't wearing crap. But it's hard to say when it will revolutionize biomechanics. Let, let's just tighten up that question a little bit. When will markerless tracking of human motion revolutionize the analysis of in-game sports performance? Well, it's already doing that. In-game, there's only one way to track in-game human motion that doesn't require the buy-in of the players. And that's with video. You can't really use sensors because I'm pretty sure the other team, the opposing team is not going to let you put the sensors on their athletes. But in video, you're tracking the opponents and yourself. So is it really Am I being too bold here when I say it's changing it now? Well, it's weird, the, the press. So does the community believe it? Here's an article from a little while ago, but it, it is this year, a few months old, Sport Techie. And read the title on the left. The technology roadmap that can turn the New York Mets into World Series champions. Guess what that technology is? Markerless tracking and biomechanics. How often has biomechanics shown up in a popular magazine as, you know, the possible factor for changing the game? Now I'm going to give you one bit of anecdotal, it's not evidence, one bit that I wish was evidence. Major League Baseball started down the path, only a few teams originally, maybe 10 years ago, started exploring using markerless tracking in-game tracking pitchers. They didn't track batters, they tracked pitchers. So for about eight years, they were teasing apart how pitchers were throwing the ball. People got involved at many, many levels. They got involved in training rooms. They got involved with minor league. They got involved with major league. They got involved in looking for cues that the opposing pitchers were giving away. Deep into it. And then they started collecting batting. Well, anybody who's looked at the newspaper lately, pitchers are dominating major league baseball. I suspect it's probably a coincidence, but I really like to think it's because people were really studying the pitchers and not the hitters. And that biomechanics and motion capture has already changed baseball. So when will this all happen? I can do it now. The when is not so much is the technology ready in biomechanics. The real question is, are the researchers ready? Are the researchers ready to ask different questions? My experience with our customers is, the younger the researcher, the more interested in this technology. I'm an old guy. I know that. It's hard for someone my age to change. Some people get it, but the young researcher we're talking to, they all get it. I'd like to thank the organizers again for giving me a chance to talk. I'd like to talk, I'd like to thank the people from C Motion and Thea.
who allow me to work for both companies. So I get the excitement of both ends. Um, and I'd like to thank the audience for hanging around for this talk. Thanks, Sean. Scott, thank well, you very much. Um, we're going to take questions now. Uh, just a uh, reminder, there's kind of two ways to ask questions. Uh, if you look at the bottom right, you'll see a participants in chat. Make sure those boxes are clicked and open. You can raise your hand uh, as Dan Ramsey you already have, so we'll get to him first. Um, and then we'll, you know, unraise your hand, unmute you, and you can ask a question, or you can put it in the chat. Um, so, Chen, I'll, I'll kind of scan both, but if I'm missing anybody, let me know. And first, we'll go to uh, uh, Chen. Can you unmute Dan Ramsey, please? And he'll ask the first question. I don't know where to look. This is so weird. Oh, Chen, Chen's going to do that. <laughs> and, and we'll, we'll, help, we'll read the questions to you. <laughs> Uh, can you hear me, Scott? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, perfect. So, first of all, thank you very much for um, a very exciting presentation. And I just sort of want to jump on board saying that uh, uh, some of this technology, as you alluded to, is being integrated in Major League in Major League Baseball. I don't know if you had a chance to look at a poster that we presented a little bit earlier on. Uh, my question to you is this, the sensitivity of, of um, the motion capture, because we're trying to look at the compensatory ad adaptation of pictures and, you know, our uh, research had to, to um, be undertaken in a lab. So our premise is that as pictures fatigue, they adopt these compensatory stride length adaptations. And I was wondering, in game situations, whether or not your system that you're advocating for would be sensitive enough to be able to identify these small but very important compensatory adaptations, which may predispose these pitchers to to uh, uh, injury of the shoulder and elbow. Sure. Um, the foot. So you're looking at foot placement. Yeah, we're looking at stride length. So right. you know. Stride, uh, stride length is going to be within a, a centimeter or two. Uh, probably a little bit more. Well, no, but, but that's uh, her accuracy. Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah. that's very, very interesting. So we, we are actually, um, I, I have a biomechanics background, not in an animation or machine vision background. Um, so there's some things we care about more than others. So we care about where the foot is on the floor. Uh, so whereas many of the systems track one or two, like two points on the foot, maybe the ankle and the toe. Um, at the end of the summer, we're going to release eleven features on each foot, so we can track the foot fairly well. Okay. So the other question I have for you is that uh, my colleague actually has worked for a couple of uh, major league organizations. And I guess it really comes down to the cameras. I mean, ideally, <laughs> in, in uh, 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 real world situation, these cameras are going to be set pretty far away from the mound. So you're going to be looking at some pretty sophisticated high resolution cameras, which is, you know, really not applicable more in a biome biomechanics lab sort of facility. And so it goes back to one of your questions a little bit earlier on about the number of cameras. And as this sort of technology continues to evolve, how many cameras do you think would be appropriate to get a good representation of uh, three dimensional motion? Okay. Um, well, eight. Um, but it depends largely on what you're tracking. One of the advantage of baseball is that if you're tracking the pitcher, it's really not a big volume. It's not the it's not the sensor. Most of them have one megapixel sensors only. Tracking the, the picture, you just have a good lens. But you're really only seeing the pitching mount. <laughs> um, if you want to do a basketball court, like half court, um, there was one team who's, who's playing around trying to, I don't think I'm allowed to say their name, but in order to see the whole court, yes, they have over 100 video cameras. But in baseball, you're focused on the picture. The, the rules for us are if the character, the actor, the player is, you know, 400 pixels tall on the image. That's plenty. That's plenty to get all the accuracy we showed. Okay. And, and one of the other questions that I have, and for this goes out to a lot of the biomechanists out in the field as well, is that 
ideally we marry in analog devices as well on top of, of uh, the kinematic parameters. And we're really more interested in joint moments and joint powers and whatnot. How do you see uh, Thea and this whole paradigm being able to integrate a lot of these other sort of analog devices to get more at the nuances of, of human movement? If most of the marker-based companies out there, Pulses, Vicon, OptiTrack, all have video cameras and all synchronize them with the force platforms. When Thea creates the pose estimation right now, it's passing it to Visual 3D. And Visual 3D takes the video images that come out of Thea, takes the forces that come out of whatever system is recording it, and computes inverse dynamics identically with how you compute a market based. So there's going to be really no need now then to go with uh, an optoelectric camera system. Probably you're just going to wind up putting in six to eight video cameras, high resolution video cameras in the lab, and then integrating it with the analog devices then. Yep, and they're not even that high resolution. We're, we're doing everything mostly with um, HD cameras or less resolution. They're not special. All right, Scott, uh, guys, just a reminder, sorry, I uh, didn't mention this in the chat. We're not getting many questions in the chat. So if, if you have a question or you put a question in the chat just to help Scott out, can you put it to all panelists and not just Scott as well? Um, and then we can read it to Scott so he doesn't have to filter oh, through all the chat. <laughs> so if you did put a, a chat or a, chat, a question in the chat box uh, to Scott, just uh, send it again, but again, uh, put it to all panelists and then Chen and I can see it as well. Um, cut, while we're waiting for that, because I don't see any hands raised up, um, how about uh, clothing and equipment? How does that affect some of the training? Uh, like, I'm, I have an interest in ice hockey, so you know, you put a boot on the skate. How does that affect yeah. kind of your training data? Um, it, it's well, obviously, if you're going to wear hockey pads, you were probably going to track it less well than if you weren't wearing hockey pads. But we do track it believably. So when you overlay the skeleton onto the hockey pads and skate, the skeleton is where you think it should be. Now, that's that's not a, a validation, but face validity, it all works now. So the training data set has people in hockey equipment, it has people in ski suits, it has people in snow suits, it has as many, as wide a variety of things as we can get. And it's, no, if you've got something bulky or some, a, a long dress, yeah, we're not gonna get the hips or knees very well. Um, but it's surprising how good it does do, all things considered. Um, we're hoping to do, I don't even know how to do the validation, frankly. Other than face validity and let's find out is the data. So there are a couple of groups that test hockey players that are testing it and using it. And and, and they believe it's good enough to do what, what they need to do. But that's all about the question, isn't it? <laughs> how much how much accuracy do you need to answer your question? If you're at the, the skate, it will find fine. The knees and the pads. Mm. All right, uh, we have a question from uh, Brandon Pinto. Uh, Chen, can you unmute him and then and then Kevin Duluzio after that? Hi. Hey. Oh, not hearing that. Uh, oh, is this any better? Uh, I, I got the last word. <laughs> that was better. Let's try again, Brent, Brandon. Coming through now? That's better. Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for the wonderful uh, presentation. And this is definitely very encouraging given the current times that we're in and it's exciting to see the advancements. Um, I was just wondering, and maybe I lost this within your talk, but you showed us an image of the um, regular uh, students at the universities in their clothing coming in for the yep. comparison between the markerless and the markered motion capture. And I was no. But Sorry? The, the, that was for the repeatability. For the marker base, we couldn't do that. Oh, okay. So I guess that kind of negates my question. <laughs> well, I mean, on the clothing, on anatomical uh, landmarks. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's why we didn't do it. But, well, thank um, you very much, regardless. This was a great presentation. I'm excited. I will say that, that one of the data sets out in the world that the machine vision people rely on for training their data is markers put on top of clothing 
So I'm really skeptical about a lot of the machine version vision stuff that's out there. For exactly the reason that you are suggesting it'd be a problem. I don't know if it's just a problem or if it's impossible. It might even be something that's important. To, yeah, important, important to know too, right? Yeah. Well, thank you. All right. Okay. Uh, so now we have a question from Kevin Deluzio. Uh, Chen, can you go ahead and unmute Kevin, please? Kevin, you should be able to speak now. Okay, can you hear me? Yep. I can hear you, Kevin. I just wanted to try the technology. No. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, Sean, great job moderating the session. And I, I think I'm, I'm amazed at how well this platform is working. I'll comment on that. So my hats off and my uh, uh, congratulations to the organizers behind this. This, is, this has been really, really, really fun and effective. Um, Scott, I, I can ask you any, but I wanted to give you a chance to think or, or talk about your approach here because it's based on static images. Yes. Right. Yes. And 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 you lose all this information by ignoring the time history. So this is a choice because you know that. And I wanted you to give you a chance to reflect and, and tell what is that a choice that you're satisfied with, and do you see a future where the time history will become important? I suppose if there were enough GPUs on the planet <laughs> that, that we could put in more than one frame of data. <laughs> um, but right now, when we tackle the problem, we're kind of filling up the GPUs on the computer. Um, it, it's really right now um, just a technical challenge of solving the neural network, um, the training data across per movement. People can do you know, a few frames of data, but I'm not sure I'm going to make biomechanists happy by saying that I, I went across three frames instead of one. Um, I think they want to see me do a whole sequence or a whole gesture. Yeah. Yeah, it would, it would be satisfying to, 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 because you know, there's information in that in yeah. the flow of the image, of course. Um, so it, it's technical right now. I hope that our technical, not meaning that it's hard, meaning that we just need a lot more <laughs> GPUs. <laughs> Um, but yeah, no, I, sometime in the future, um, I hope it gets to that point. The advantage though, of course, to having the single image and, and besides being yeah. possible, practical, is that it, it doesn't matter if we're standing with someone with neurological disorders. Yes. Because it's just one frame of data. If they look like a person, we can find. Yeah, there's no smoothness. There's no smoothness requirement of the motion. There's no smoothness requirement, so we Thank can track you. whatever we whatever we see. Thanks, I enjoyed this. <laughs> Thanks, Kevin. Uh, I have a question from the uh, chat box from Ryan. Uh, he's asking, could you follow up, uh, asking if it is possible for researchers to train the system to better improve tracking athletes wearing equipment? So, can, can the researchers contribute to that as well, or? No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> was that a little blunt? Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's it, I mean the hardest thing most of the research now that I mean we're we're totally satisfied that given the data, given a feature, that every time we add a new feature, all features get better. It's one of the quirks of this approach is every time we add a feature. So the difference between a neural network of 27 features and a neural network of 51 features or 100 features, the more features, all features get better. That's one part of this craziness. Now, there's a lot of talk of, of transfer learning, and, and that's what's out in the community. And that means you take something like our training set, and the user does a little bit of their own, and then retrains a new network. What we found is quality assurance is the hardest thing we do knowing which images can't be done and which can, which which features to ignore, blah, 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 blah. It goes on and on. Quality assurance is the hardest thing. And so we're a little reluctant to just let the user do as they will. Now, having said that, we do offer that if you have something that we haven't seen and you send us some data to just refine the network, we will refine the network for you. 
so that we can keep it within our quality assurance standards. But we will refine a net for someone. Yes. If you're tracking human movement, that's fairly a reasonable request that we can do quite easily. Um, if you're asking us to do a dog, yeah, we're not there yet. But yes, we, we can refine it. And yes, refining in a unique environment. Any lab is a unique environment. Um, if you train specifically and refine your network in that environment, the, the data will get better. And and we know that, so we, we will offer that service right now. Will we get to the point where we let the users do it? I, I don't know. I don't I don't actually know how to support that right now. All right, uh, we've got about two more questions, I think. Sure. Um, so we'll go to Michael Rainbow first. Uh, Chen, can you unmute him? And we'll let, uh, and we'll do a bit of quicker questions if we could. Thanks, Pat. That was really great. Time. Oh, thanks, Mike. Really enjoyed it. Um, yeah, I guess it's kind of a follow up question to that. Is um, have you thought about sort of how you would accommodate, um, say, like if you're doing like a rehab reaching task and you need to track the object as well, or like, you know, in our lab we're thinking about upper extremity stuff with a cable, like tracking the yeah. cable and things like that. Yeah, it's, it, it, I've got a good answer and a bad answer. Uh, the good answer is it's objects tend to not be deformable. If there's a rigid object, they're actually quite easy to train. The unsatisfying reality is that we haven't trained them yet. So we've, we've trained one object to prove that you could do it. So we trained, actually we trained the calibration one, um, a marker-based calibration one just to prove we could. But we, we have to get there, Mike. Yeah, because there's there's relevance to what you're holding in your hand, and it's also more information. Right. Because if you're holding it in your hand, your fingers can't go inside the object. So right. it is more information. So we will get there. Um, it's an it's an ongoing tension <laughs> in the company. No, <laughs> Let's put it that way. <laughs> All right, we have a question from Rashid uh, Chen. Can you go ahead and uh, unmute him? And then I think we got one more question in the chat from Dan, and then we'll, that's probably going to be about it. So go ahead, Rashid. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Cham. Thank you, Scott, for your uh, <laughs> good presentation. Uh, my name is Rashid. I am from ETS Montreal. So I've been working in uh, from motion analysis and Vicon system for a long time now, and I'm doing a pro uh, project on markerless marker with one camera video with diving. So it's a very complex and yeah. still not get any good results. And I have two, just two comments quickly. One is about what you said about all the database like human uh, 3.6 and Coco and things like that, where there is a million of uh, video images has been labeled, but we don't know what is the accuracy of this labeling. We don't know who do it. I have students that do labeling for 5,000 images and I just check the hip and uh, most of the time it was wrong. So yeah. my question is about this kind of transfer learning. You need a good database at the origin. Yes, you do. So, so. what's your uh, point of view on this aspect? Our point of view is first we need to get a really good database before we start doing it. <laughs> <laughs> my my, my <laughs> good. <laughs> my second. <laughs> how, many, how many images do we have? We really have more than a million images. Yeah, right? so, yeah, that's uh, right. Um, uh, the second yes. question, which is very quick, uh, because I know time is passing, is what about in markerless? What about skin movement artifact? What What's your opinion on that? I, I would be happy to. Um, for some of the artifacts, particularly artifact that's kind of axial rotation, so you supinate, pronate your forearm. Yeah. Um, that that artifact is is not a, a real problem for us um, because you're really looking at, at the shape and the, the problem in markerless is is the bones moving with the markers. I, I we don't know quite how to test it. Um, what I I I mean at some point we're going to twist Mike Rainbow's arm to answer a question earlier, and we're going to and we're going to look at the markerless with the X-ray data on, on the foot okay. or the hand. Okay. Or the shoulder, which he's doing now, we think there's less susceptibility to soft tissue movement. Okay, I think there's less, but less. it's hard to prove. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, and uh, we're gonna finish up with one more question. Sorry, if we didn't get to all the questions. Um, so, 
some of the data you showed, it, it was presented with kind of a young, uh, low BMI population. Yeah. Well, how has there been much training on on uh, people with higher BMI, and you know the accuracy of the system has that been tested with people with a, a kind of a higher BMI as well? The higher BMI is coming, as you can imagine. It's a really hard study. It's it's kind of like doing the hockey player in pads. Uh, what are we comparing to? Um, and I'm, I'm guessing that it's just going to be a repeatability, reliability measures. Um, I don't know who's in the audience out there, but if um, I, I think I think Monica tends to do that with with her subjects that are have very high BMIs. I think so. That will be done, um, Monica Malley. I'm talking about. If you're out there, Monica, um, we're going to figure out how to do that with you yet. Um, that's and what was the other part? Now I've forgotten. <laughs> No, that, that was the main question was just about, you know, how it works with people with a uh, higher BMIs. I, I didn't know if you had that uh, in your training Kev, program. Or yeah, Ke Kevin Labs is Kevin's lab is starting to collect older subjects. They've even collected me. Um, so we're starting to get a little bit more breadth in the, in the subjects. Uh, but the high BMI we've not really tackled yet. All right, Scott, I appreciate you uh, coming here and again, also for C motion and Thea uh, sponsoring. Uh, well, not just the session, but also the awards and uh, being the primary sponsor of the conference or the meeting. Um, just a reminder everyone that if you're a student, we have our student trivia night tonight. So again, uh, please take a look at the schedule register if you can, and, or if not, just show up at uh, I think it's 8 o'clock. So again, thank you, Scott. I know we can't give a round of applause. I think, <laughs> I think there's some thumb up feature somewhere somewhere, oh, okay. uh, but uh, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, yeah, we're gonna be closing the session now and we'll see everyone thank tomorrow. Yeah, thank you, Sean. It was a wonderful experience. Thanks. Yeah, if I didn't.